So now we are going to discuss uh, type checking in more detail. Before that, I want to point out that type checking and type inference are actually quite similar and because they rely on the same set of typing rules. Uh, checking involves uh, checking that, you know, if the program is obeying rules. So when you are doing type checking, you basically assume that all the types are available. So each and every expression, for example, in the program has been annotated with its respective type. And checking just involves uh, checking whether type checking just involves checking whether the annotated types obey all the typing rules or not. In contrast, inference is about filling in the missing types. So uh, when you are doing type inference, some of the types are missing, and uh, you can you just use the same set of typing rules to fill those missing types. So in, uh, as opposed to checking whether the type rules are being satisfied. If the type is not available, then you kind of infer that this is the type. Now, uh, type inference may not be always possible uh, because uh, maybe the context is not enough to uniquely specify a type. For example, there could be multiple types that may uh, follow, that may obey the rules and the type hasn't been specified, so we can't say which one it is. So in general, inference is not always possible, but, uh, but often it is possible. Uh, different languages have different uh, designs uh, with respect to whether they do type checking or type inference. For example, a language like C or C++ would have a lot of manually annotated types. So you are supposed to annotate, for example, the types of all the local variables, global variables, function arguments, functions, function signatures, classes, etc., class objects, and so on. But there are, for example, in C, if I just write uh, 1 plus 2, or if I write x plus y, and let's say x was of type uh, integer and y was of type long, then there is some set of typing rules that is used to identify the type of x plus y. Now, these types are, for the expressions, are not manually annotated, but inferred. So even C, for example, has type inference. More recently, C++, for example, has the auto keyword. So you can use the auto keyword anywhere, but it's only a limited form of type inference. So sometimes the C++ compiler will, will be able to infer the type whenever you use auto. So auto is supposed to mean automatic type inference. So you just say, instead of declaring a variable with its type, you say auto x and then use and then assign it to something. And based on that, the type of x would be inferred. Now, so inference has limitations. And so sometimes it will work, sometimes it will not work. Uh, languages, in fact, have very well-defined rules on when it will work and when it will not work. Uh, just to take another example, functional programming languages like OCaml, they have they are largely in, uh, based on inference of types and not checking of types. Uh, but sometimes, even there, you need to manually annotate the types so that uh, the compiler can disambiguate between multiple choices. Okay, so so. Because type checking and type inference are so similar, uh, or people often use these two, two terms interchangeably. In any case, uh, both these, whether we talk about checking or whether we talk about inference, we are supposed to have a base set of typing rules based on which we will either check or infer. And, and we are going to now, our next discussion, the next few modules is, will be about what these typing rules could look like. And we'll take some example language and then we'll try to specify typing rules for that language to give us a flavor of what kind of typing rules are used in a typical language. So to be able to specify the rules, we are going to specify a type checking formalism. What is a formalism? It is just a formal notation used to specify typing rules precisely. So instead of just you know talking in English or something like that, we're going to define our own small logical language in which we are going to be able to say that what is of what type and so on. This formalism is going to take the shape of inference rules. And what is an inference rule? Well, it is uh, some kind of a statement which looks like the following. If hypothesis is true, then conclusion is true. All right. And, you know, basically, whenever I will, I'm going to specify an inference rule, I will just specify the hypothesis and then specify the conclusion. I'm not going to, you know, use these extra words. If is true, then is true. That's just a, sh sh you know, that's just implicit in those in that notation. And so I just want to keep things, keep all the uh, extraneous stuff out, and just focus on uh, the exact rule. All right. Okay. So, for example, in our case of type checking or type inference, we will have rules of the type. 
if e1 has a certain type and e2 has some other certain type then e3 would have a certain type okay so let's look at an example so for example uh, i would i could you know i i'm going to use this notation here this notation here to basically say x colon t which basically stands for x has type t right where so x is an expression and type t is a type all right so for example i will, i may want to say if e1 is of type t this uh, represents a conjunction operator and so if e1 is of type t and e2 is of type t so these two form my hypothesis then so this is the if then um, symbol so you can read it as implies but i can also read it as if this is true then this is true so this is the conclusion then e1 plus e2 is of type t now i haven't said what is type t maybe you know i i may want to have different types so may i i may want to even have a rule that says t1 t2 and t3 this is just a example to explain the shape or the form of a typing rule all right i can even write this kind of a typing rule in this form and this will be my uh, short form or notation for uh, inference rules now this notation is basically something that is very popular because of uh, historical reasons and people use it a lot so it's good to understand this notation because we are also going to use similar notation it's a very concise form of writing what we for what we had here here basically firstly we have this long line that separates the hypotheses which are appearing at the top of the line and the conclusion which is appearing below the line the hypotheses are just separated by space or you know comma or new line or something like that so i don't i kind of omit the uh, and operator so in this case it says also have this weird operator called uh, the turn style operator right so this this operator i'm calling it the turn style operator and uh, the turn style operator basically should be read as it is provable that so the hypothesis is saying if it is provable that e1 is of type t and if it is provable that e2 is of type t then it is provable that then it is provable that e1 plus e2 is of type t all right okay so so this is just another notation for for this particular sentence that we had earlier uh, these this notation is called an inference rule this uh, turn style operator stands for it is provable that and this long line here represents separates hypotheses from conclusions all right so inference rule is basically looks like this hypothesis 1 and hypothesis 2 and dot 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 and hypothesis n so a set of n hypotheses implies conclusion in other words if hypothesis 1 and hypothesis 2 and so on dot that hypothesis n hold then conclusion holds all right that's what this an inference rule looks like and this is the this is the form of inf this is the notation in which we are going to write these inference rules if it is provable that hypothesis 1 is true if it is provable that hypothesis 2 is true and so on then it is provable that conclusion is true now this is a type rule okay in addition to a type rule we also basically have a notion of a name of a type rule this is just to easily refer to a certain type rule so we may have some name here right so when we are going to look at uh, type rules we are also going to give them a name so that it becomes easy to refer to them uh, and so on all right so for example uh, type rules would have hypotheses of the form it is provable that e is of type t right so this is a single colon all right and and actually even the conclusions are of the same form so as as we just saw the hypotheses and conclusions that uh, can include this form of a uh, uh, statement which is it is provable that some expression is of some type t so to read it it is provable that expression e is of type t this is how you read this particular uh, notation it is provable that e expression e is of type t right okay so now we are uh, ready to start defining our first few typing rules and before we do that let me introduce you to uh, 
the programming language for which I'm going to define the typing rules. Now I wanted to pick a programming language that is very close to the typically popular programming languages like C, C++, Java, Python, etc. And so our programming language is also like C, C++. Uh, however, we don't you know, capture all the possible uh, scenarios of C and C++. We're just looking at some subset of C and C++. Also, we kind of deviate from the actual semantics of C and C++ in our programming language a little bit. All right. For example, we basically assume that the declarations in new scope can only be occur at the beginning of a new scope and cannot be interspersed with statements. This is like going back into the older versions of C. Uh, this is just for simplicity. Our, our goal is to not define a full-fledged language, but just to look at some simplistic subset of a typical language and look at the typing rules that it supports. Uh, so that we get a flavor of what uh, what the full-fledged language typing rules would be. Also, in our uh, programming language, even statements represent values and are thus associated with types. So in a language like C or C++, a statement is not associated with any value. Expressions are associated with a value. In other words, expressions compute a value. Statements are just supposed to be, so just supposed to compute something, but they don't really return a value. Right, so... Uh, in our language, we are not, we're going to get rid of that uh, assumption. Uh, instead, we are, what we're going to do is we're going to consider statements as also expressions. All right? So we're not going to make a distinction between statements and expressions. And every uh, both statements and expressions will be, we, I'm just going to use the term expressions from now on. So every expression will have a value, including expressions that, for example, uh, end with a semicolon or something like that. Or if I have a list of uh, statements, I'm just going to call that a single expression. So for example, the body of an entire function can be thought of as an expression. All right? Whereas in the original C and C++ languages, the body of a function would be called a statement. So this is just a, you know, this is just a uh, deviation from C, C++ semantics to be able to uh, show some interesting uh, ways, uh, typing rules uh, in, these, in these environments. Okay. Further, I'm going to assume that uh, this language is object-oriented and, uh, and it has the typical subtyping relation based on uh, derived types and base types, just like the example we just saw. Also, I'm going to assume one more uh, fact that the void type is a super type of all types. So I'm going to assume that everything is a derived type of the void type or everything, every other type is a derived type of the void type. For example, the int type, the integer type in C, the int type is, I'm going to assume that it's a subtype of void. Right, so what is a what is a value of type void? It's it's a value that cannot be used for anything. Right, for example, you can do plus on an integer, right? Or you could do concatenation on a string. What can you do on void? You can't do anything. But all the other types, I'm assuming that they are kind of a subtype of the void type because you can do more things with those subtypes. But uh, but but I'm just going to assume uh, that they are all uh, um, descending or you know. Deri deriving from this base type, universally base type called void. And, and the void type really has, n has no operations, no legal operations on it. Okay, why am I doing this? Well, it makes some of the discussion easier. Uh, we don't have to you know, take special cases and so on. Also, uh, it, it does represent uh, some type systems, some real world type systems, not C, C++ type system, but some other type systems of real programming languages. So it's, it's good to kind of uh, look at this kind of scenario as well. Okay, so let's, uh, and let's look at our first typing rule. So the first typing rule says, if i is an integer literal, so what is an integer literal? Well, you know, some, any constant like one, two, three, or one, uh, seven, eight, nine, or six, four, five, or whatever. So if it is an integer literal, and um, recall that we already have using our lexing phase and all that in our abstract syntax tree, we already identified all the integer literals explicitly. So if i is an integer literal, then it is provable that i is of type int. All right, so this is a typing rule and I also give it a name and that's the name called int. So notice that I'm assuming here that int is a type and that it is in a C, C++ like language. And, I'm, and, and the precondition says i is an integer literal. It's easy to check because in my abstract syntax tree, I already have that kind of uh, information. Uh, 
is then it is provable that i is of type int so now this is a typing rule i can use it either for type checking or for type inference typically for example in a language like c we don't really explicitly say that this is you know if i just write 1 2 3 it's kind of implicit that this is uh, an integer and that's because the compiler is doing a type inference based on this particular rule all right okay um, but you are also welcome to actually annotate and say that this is a type int and in which case uh, it would the compiler would just type check and that's it okay now here's another typing rule if it is provable that e1 is of type int and it is provable that e2 is of type int then it is provable that e1 plus e2 is of type int i'm going to call this the add rule add typing rule okay so for example let's say i want to check what is the type of 1 plus 2 so i want to so to be able to identify the type i need to basically either infer or you know, so i could have basically two once again i could either do checking or i could do inference in the checking world i would have the annotation that maybe this is already an int and then i would prove that the, these these rules are actually being obeyed in this annotation in case of inference i just have to infer so let's let's take the example of inference because here it's actually possible to infer and so i'm going to say okay so what how am i going to infer what how am i going to infer the type of 1 plus 2 well i'm going to say 1 is an integer literal so 1 is of type int 2 is an integer literal so 2 is of type int and 1 is in type 1 is of type int and 2 is of type int thus it must be true that 1 plus 2 is of type int so what do i do i basically apply the int rule twice once for 1 and another time for 2 and then finally i apply the add rule all right so this is this is what uh, my proof looks like the first the first time i apply the int rule which is 1 is an integer literal that means it must be provable that 1 is an int 2 is an integer literal so it must be provable that 2 is an int and finally 1 is an int it is provable that 1 is an int it is provable that 2 is an int so it must be provable that 1 plus 2 is an int so this is an example of uh, a very simple example of two type rules and how it can be used to identify the type of an expression